Welcome to my Collaborative Teams Introductory Learning Program. This program meets once a month on the fourth Thursday at the same time, at this same time, from now until October, leading into the IECP Annual Forum. We will take you from our initial discussion of what is the collaborative law process to October's discussion of the final team debrief. In between, we will cover how to make and maintain the paradigm shift, how to build your collaborative team, how to get your collaborative practice started, how to market and network, and then we will take a deeper dive discussing collaborative process pointers, including how to use collaborative for prenups, postnups, and even non-family matters. We invite you to join us for all 10 sessions. For those who do attend all sessions, you'll be eligible in our drawing for a free registration at the IACP Forum, compliments of MCT. My collaborative team is a not-for-profit corporation. Our mission is to provide marketing and educational opportunities for our members in building more successful collaborative practices, utilizing our digital and virtual marketing outlets. The main goal of my collaborative team is to be the leading publisher and producer of collaborative process content and to be a marketing partner for our members promoting the collaborative process throughout North America. We provide our members the confidence, assistance, and platforms they need to distinguish themselves as collaborative professionals. Our newsletter is distributed to over 15,000 family professionals across North America, including 6,000 collaboratively trained lawyers, mental health professionals, and financial professionals two times per week. We invite you to check out our website at www.mycollaborativeteam.com. We hope you'll join us and support what we are doing. For most of our members, their MCT listing appears near the top of a Google search of their name. So for the next two months, we'll be talking about team building. Today, we will discuss the basics of teamwork. What does it mean to work as a team? How do you get your team to play nice in the sandbox? What are things we can do individually to the, be the best teammate to those around us? And what happens when you end up on a team with members you don't choose or may not approve of? And then next month, we will dive deeper into the workings of a collaborative team with guest speakers, Susan Guthrie and Brian Galbraith. But for today, our guests are, are two gentlemen who do not practice in the collaborative world, but have tons of experience with team building. Matt Levin is the current president and CEO of the Jewish Federation of South Palm Beach County in Florida. A native Southeastern Floridian, Matt has over 25 years of experience with APAC, where he had served most recently as Southeastern States Director and Florida Region Director. Matt's leadership has been marked by an array of successful initiatives designed to engage and connect residents, leaders, and organizations with an inclusive federation that serves as a vibrant, effective convener for the entire community. Steve Turner is a nationally recognized expert on human anti-human trafficking, protection from abuse and violent assault against women. Steve for, formerly served as the chief counsel to the Pennsylvania Department of State, chief counsel to the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, and chief counsel to the Pennsylvania Office of Inspector General. He is an expert on working with others as a team during traumatic situations. Steve is also a member of MCT and has been trained as a collaborative professional. Now, before we get started, first, we have some poll questions we would like you to answer. Eric? That's the first poll question. we just like to know, is this your first time being with us um, or have you been with us before at this specific programming? We've done two of these prior. Just trying to gauge if you've been here before or if you are new to our program. We appreciate your participation. We just have two more questions after this one. They'll be real quick and we'll get right into our presentation. A couple more seconds here. Okay, I think we got enough of a gauge there. Thank you. Next, we just want to know what is your discipline? What is your discipline? Obviously, our presenters, as we've explained, are neither. So if you're None of these, feel free to select other.
Thank you all once again for your participation. And last but not least, this poll question relating to our presentation today. Do you consider yourself to be a good teammate? Do you consider yourself to be a good teammate? And these are all anonymous, so feel free to answer truthfully. Perfect, there we go. Perfect. And I just wanna confirm our presenters do see the results. Terrific, okay, great. Thank you guys for your participation. Great, thank you, Eric. So let's get started, Matt. We, we can say, you know, it's easy for us to say, let's work as a team. But tell me, what does it really mean to work as a team? Oh, in my, in my line of business, in, you know, in the nonprofit field, um, teamwork kind of is the epitome. So you can't, you can't have a, a, a team environment working to raise money, do advocacy, do all the pieces without sharing um, a series of tr attributes that kind of lead up to being the proper teammate. And for me, it's taken me time. Each, I've had two professional jobs, 25 years at APAC. 10 years uh, now as CEO of the Federation, and it takes time to build the team around you. You have to sometimes uh, replace people, you have to move people in. But there are several things that I've used over the last 30 years. Like there's a, there's, I use the term clap. Uh, and when I'm talking about leadership and building both board members, but also professional team members, you have to have four attributes that I think make, uh, at least for the kind of teamwork I do. One is, so, so it's the, what I use the word clap. One is, uh, is commitment. The ability to commit. You're not only committing your personal but in your case, especially those of you that are family attorneys, you're committing your, you're taking on the holiest responsibility. You know, as someone who went through a divorce and did not have a collaborative effort, um, I can tell you that not even knowing that a collaborative effort was out there would have benefited me much greater than it did. I mean, today, me and my ex-wife have a, a, a good, decent relationship, but frankly, a lot of that would have done. So the notion that it, what was important to me was my attorney was committed to my, per, my people, my you know, committed to my life, committed to me, and I never felt that she wasn't. And so the notion that commitment makes a good team, I assume for you all, has to be that commitment. Second is loyalty. You've got to be able to trust the other members of your team, whether it's in my environment, in a legal environment, that you, they have your back at all times, that there's never an agenda by another member of the team. If you don't have parity among team, at least again, in my field, um, you're destined to fail. Because the moment you have that person on the team, that's looking out for number one only, you're destined to fail. And, you know, we, I come from a community. Uh, I see my friend uh, Sheila Fur on the phone, who I've known for too many years. Remember, but I come from a community that had for a long time as a federation reputation of bad behavior, in large part because people came from other parts of the country, both lay leadership, but also professionals. And in the 10 years, we don't have that. We have peace in the land. We have agencies to get along in partnership because everybody's bought into this all for one is free to core um, uh, piece. And that's about, and then a lot of that is related to loyalty, loyalty to the cause and loyalty to the process. The third piece is making yourself available. Um, being available means when you're part of a team, you just don't have to worry about your schedule. You have to worry about everybody else's and you have to be available both to your teammates uh, as well as to your clients, but important, most importantly to your teammates, because we have no idea what else is happening in someone else's life. Uh, that means making sacrifices uh, for the good of the team. And that means making yourself available and making yourself free to be there uh, for the rest of your team. And the final piece is proud, is take pride in your work. If you don't have pride in your work and you don't have pride in the team effort in a collaborative uh, uh, sense, we're never going to raise $15 million. We're never going to build a senior facility, a $400 million senior facility on my campus without uh, the pride that it is that we're doing that to help a community and the people that need, need to be most helped. So I'll, I'll stop there and, and go back to you, Ed. Matt, you, you, you brought an interesting point together, um, the idea of trust within a team. I had a team meeting just this past week. It was our first team meeting in a case. And it started with um, the wife saying that she didn't necessarily trust her attorney, that something had happened. She sort of explained it. The attorney didn't lose it. The team sort of built around it. And at the in our pre-brief, in our post-brief, the attorney said, you know, I felt comfortable not saying anything to my own client because of the trust I have in the team and, and knowing that the team would back me up. So that's critical. Steve, I, I know that you don't get the chance. Matt gets to build teams and that's part of what his, he does is, is build teams, um, you know, to do, to achieve their goal. You're oftentimes thrust into teams. Tell us how you work with teams. Yeah. Ed, I'll tell you, I mean, it's, it's, uh, 
uh, doing anti-trafficking work, I mean, the, the, the trauma, I mean, the horrific trauma the trafficking survivors come, th th that I interact with them in an emergency department, in a trauma bay, a police station, a sh the street, our shelter, whatever. And, and there's, there can be just an, an emergent and immediate grouping of people, some of whom you've never met before, and you've got to rally around to try and be, you've got to be trauma informed. You've got to help people navigate safety, not only physical safety, but just as important emotional safety. And then you, you so you look at the collaborative process. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm an attorney, but, but I'm not, I'm not a family practitioner, but, but, you know, the divorce process is one of the most traumatic events that a human being is going to go through. There is trauma all along the way. Even, even relatively peaceful ones that arrive on your doorstep, let alone high conflict ones, uh, or ones with, for example, a history of domestic violence or sexual assault. I mean, you got loads and layers of trauma. And so that, that, that's where I think the trauma intersection that I deal with on an emergent basis and what you folks are going to deal with too. And so de-escalating, I mean, to, to try and prevent as much as possible any future trauma and de-escalate and mitigate trauma through solutions you come up with. You know, I was thinking about, I mean, I, I, I just, I guess I just do this because I'm just, just this, just last week, I was in a secure youth detention center with a 14 year old girl that had been trafficked and, and, and gang raped at age 11 and, and life was sideways from there. And I'm there with three people I didn't know. And we are all trying to um, feed off each other without without any obvious interaction uh, other than trust and compassion and hope. One of the things that I thought about, as Matt was saying, you know, in terms of th there can be th you can have all sorts of books and PowerPoints, all those kinds of stuff about building a team. You know, one of the things I think, though, is simply everyone here has been on a team where it was it, it didn't go well or you weren't treated right. If we all simply don't do to others the badness that we have experienced in a team, you start there as a baseline and then don't do that. And then from the front end, and I use an IDF, an Israeli Defense Force thing, you lead from the front meaning. You, 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 you gather people together, but you lead from the front that, hey, I'm willing to I'm willing to step forward and make sure that this team is together and with me, and we are going we are going to take care of each other. And that leading from the front, but also watching the back door, those two are key things because then the objective is, how do we manage this couple or couple and children and get them through as deconflicted as as mitigating or limiting further trauma? And that's that's key. Matt, when putting together a, a team. What are some of the attributes you look for for team members? I mean, it, it, the, the, the key is they have to inherently not be, not be selfish. One of the things that I try to do, especially with my senior staff in the interview process, in the vetting process, is to take, a, take measure of them, that they've got to be able to sit at the table and put their ego below. That, you know, when I said before about, uh, about loyalty, really loyalty is also trust, right? So you've got to be able to trust that putting a team member you know, on the table is there, at the table is going to be somebody that you're not only going to trust in, that's going to be loyal to the process. So for me, I'm looking for people that are leave ego at the door that I believe will be part of a collaborative process. Because, uh, and, and as one of the reasons I think Becky, when, when Becky uh, referred me to do this, is that I spent a lot of time on this particular notion of putting together the right team, both lay and pro. Uh, and for me, it's got to be, you know, even, even when you're thinking about who could be uh, a chair of the board, you know, in a lay capacity, it's got to be somebody who's willing to put their ego down and take the hits as well as the glory. Uh, and so, so for me, that that attribute of, of of being able to know inherently that you have a gut instinct and a trust there, and then they have to be able to show, you know, they have to be illustrated in 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 how we go about making decisions and how we go about group think. So the work we do is a lot of group think. It's a lot of brain drain, uh, where I bring together my senior staff and we vet the issue. At the end of the day, at times I have to make a decision that's not um, uh, that's not going to be a group de a decision, but by and large, it's a collaborative process to get there. Uh, and that's because the people in the room have all performed and been evaluated through an objective and subjective process uh, handled through an HR process in such a way 
that I now trust them to make very large strategic decisions about our organization, about our businesses. Great, thanks. Um, we're going to watch a little video here real quick, and then we're going to come back and talk about how you can be the best teammate you can be. Eric? Mr. Cruz, are you lost, sir? What I got to do to play? Mr. Cruz, you do not want to know the answer to that question. Okay, Mr. Cruz. Before you can play on this team, you owe me... 2,500 push-ups and 1,000 suicides. Damn. Damn. Oh, and they must be completed by Friday. I'm going to finish that by Friday. He ain't making it. Oh. They call out them picks. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Move up. Give up, Mr. Cruz. Go home. <sighs> You know your task is impossible before Friday, right? Move! Work it, work it! Run it back! Play. Mr. Cruz. I'm impressed with what you've done. But you came up short. You owe me 80 suicides and 500 push-ups. Please leave my gym. I'll do push-ups for him. You said we're a team. One person struggles and we all struggle. One player triumphs, we all triumph, right? I'll do some. I'll run suicides too. count. Call me when they're done. You know, um, go, ahead. go ahead. I was just gonna say, sports is the ultimate team, right? So that, you know, you think about that scene right there. I think about the scene out of Remember the Titans. It's it, sports is the great allegory because to what, what, you know, those of us who are basketball fans, we talk about, you know, we retired of NBA in 2021 because it's a me game, right? But why does March Madness captivate us? Because it's all about these kids. It's all about freshmen and sophomores and juniors that if the forward doesn't play well, they're going to lose. If the center's off his game, they're going to lose because it's all about a team game. Uh, I thought that was incredible. I think that it, it's it, it's exactly what collaborative or any kind of teamwork is, is about: is picking up where others can't can't lift at the time. I think that's incredible. So, gentlemen, in the collaborative process, we don't always get to choose all the team members. They're chosen sometimes for us, but you you know, one uh, party hires their attorney. Hopefully, the other party then hires another collaborative attorney. So, the two attorneys don't necessarily choose you know, to be on the team together. The very often the two attorneys then choose the other team members. What do you do? How do you handle situations um, when both, uh, when all team members aren't willing to play in the sandbox, you know, or, or not willing to play nice together? What's the, what's the type of actions you need to take? 
to me, it's leadership. I mean, Stephen. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, thank you. It's again, you're right. I, I go back to IDF. I mean, lead from the front, take a risk. I mean, and and take a risk and show through leadership that, that you're willing to put yourself aside and keep objectives in mind. I think, you know, I think this when when you disassemble a house, a home, a family, and then you're going to build is if we can get the team members, even if some of them don't even like each other necessarily or haven't worked together or there's some personality barbs on sharp edges, you're building a new home. You're building a new home for either a couple or a couple in children. And building a new home is, is, is such an important responsibility. And along that, they, so then if you keep in mind and keep reinforcing, you're building a new home, we want to protect the vulnerable. And we always want to keep mind of if there are power imbalances, let us rebalance the power dynamic. And that means constantly, constantly assessing, reassessing both verbal and, and body language cues and clues of where people are in this process. And then, Ed, you know, the, the pre-team meetings and the post-team or post-session meetings, the, that's, where, that's where pure naked honesty needs to come in when, again, and if there's sharp elbows coming, but then we can soften those elbows with, again, we are building a new house for the, for this new family. There, there's the, there's the, there's the antecedent family. And then there's, there's the new family, whatever that's going to be. And that responsibility is huge. Go ahead, at, Matt, I'm sorry. Was, no, 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 Steve. I just want to, I just want to bell's one thing. It, it, at the end of the day, collaborative team, collaborative partnerships and teamwork doesn't mean you give up leadership. That means that there are times leadership's thrust upon you because you have to then be the one. If one member of your team, one of the members of your team is bringing you down or not carrying their load, then it's incumbent to have that. that somebody just said in the chat, it's about self-reflection. It's a very much self-reflection, but I'm going the other way with it. It's a self-reflection to say, I have to take the bull by the horns and I'm the one who's got to make this thing uh, uh, come together the way we need it for our client. Uh, that's, that's about leadership and it's about being, you know, understanding the moment that you're in. So what do you do with that person on your team who is not playing well, who's, who's, you know, your team's going, you've got one member who's just not doing it. You've, you may have discussed it. You may not. How, how do you go about rebuilding a team that's, that's fractured? Look, we have come from different perspectives. I come from a hierarchical place. So I, it's easy for me to say I'm the CEO uh, that I can, I can make my team members, you know, be more cooperative in other ways, but that's not ever the point. When I have a team member that doesn't, I take that team member aside and say, "Look, we have we we have a one we have one way of doing business. Okay, there's one methodology to how we do it. We come together and we when we go outside of these doors, we are united as a team, presenting to our leadership and to our board of directors or to the community our initiatives. So you know, again, I think part of it, whether it's whether you're in my case, you know, whether you're in, in my case a CEO or just replying all the whatever the common ground is. Rebecca's saying rely on the neutrals, which I think is. Come, come back together about the stuff that matters, the, 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 the common denominators to try and bring them back into a place where they, where they could be more prolific in what they're trying to do. And, and, and I'll, I'll follow up on that, Matt, too. I mean, it's on my screen here, my, my limited view, I see Rhonda Fuchs. And so Rhonda is my nuclear weapon right there. I mean, I'm going to get, I'm going to get Rhonda or a Rhonda. Uh, and there's so many, there's so many mental health professionals here that are on this. And, and I'm going to utilize them for everything I can to have them help. Let, let's, let's see, what, why, why are we off the rails? Is it a personality conflict? Is it, is, is it that somebody's not, somebody's kind of lost sight, perhaps, of, of interest-based focus? Or again, you know, it, it, are there communication styles? You know, we, we all know, we all have different communication styles. Maybe there's things that can be remedied pretty quickly, but an honest non-confrontational um uh yeah and and randy heller you're right i apologize you know what randy you're right i shouldn't use nuclear weapon and i mean this i i meant to describe Rhonda. that's that is nice and randy you're right you know what i'm watching too much of this ukraine stuff and i am out of my mind about putin so my apologies um but yeah use use somebody that the mental health professional to make to make um to to make things smooth out and refocus again on the global goal. And that's key. 
you mentioned a, a hierarchy. Um, how can we put that aside and utilize the strengths of our team members? You know, so how do we get some to step aside, like the lawyer stepping aside for the neutrals? Look, I, 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 that, that's got to be people have to buy into this, this notion. I think the way, what you, the way you've explained and the way I, I'm understanding the way in which your business works as collaborative partnerships, you, you know, you, you are giving up, to a certain extent, you're giving up leadership that everybody provides leadership. But that still becomes that particular piece where you're going to have to have the uncomfortable conversations and willing to challenge the beliefs. It may be over one case where one of your partners says, this is not in the best interest of the client. I disagree with this. And you guys are going to have to figure out what that common ground is. Um, but, uh, you know, to me, if you're not if you're not honest and you're not transparent uh, and, and what, you're not doing that person a favor by, by um, letting that person continue to be part of a partnership because you're that that problem will fester. It'll fester in the case that you're in. It'll fester into the next issue that you're with. So, you know, you're not that prevent for to do be part of a collaborative partnership. If they don't buy in and you're not going to change their opinion, you're not going to change their personality. Matt, you raise a, an interesting point, that being the, the transparency, uh, part of the collaborative process, the participation agreement uh, that we sign requires transparency. But many of us think of that strictly as transparency of the parties, of the, of the clients, um, making sure that they're transparent in providing all the information. Um, but I think it's real important. I'd like to hear more on this idea that you have to be transparent as team members um with each other um and what do you do when one when you don't feel like one's being transparent or when one almost doesn't want to participate uh john susco questions you know what if one of the attorneys won't uh join a debrief of course i see that as a, a major under you know a, a problem with a team that you want to consider but you know how important is that transparency I think that's the policing that you have to do, because if you don't have that transparency, and that transparency is not just simply about initiatives or in your cases, files or ideas, it's, that's a, it's about emotions, it's about body language, it's about uh, the transparency of, of, of everybody buying in. If you don't, if they're not willing to buy in, one of the biggest problems that happens in teamwork or in collaborative mm -hmm. is that people are afraid to approach the hard questions. They're afraid, they're afraid oftentimes to bring that team member to task. You can't. Because if you if you don't do that and you don't take the uh, if you well so Randy says trust among professionals he's right that's the part I said about clap and, and loyalty and trust but you're not going to have that at the beginning right you're going to have to sometimes you're building a new team you might have to do that there may be one or two cases they do great on the first case but the second case you see some personality you know quirks that you don't want to have you cannot avoid having the uncomfortable conversations with team members it's the only way to make a better team uh, because you have to be willing to say to them we don't believe we don't believe you're giving us the full, uh, the full efforts of your, you know, of, of your thoughts. You're either, you're holding back or you're not being transparent or you're not bought into what's in the best interest of the client alone. You're looking at, you know, one side of it, but you have to be able to do taking a teammate to task. Steve, I know that you're thrust into, you know, you, you end up in emergency rooms all the time where, where, you know, a trafficked uh, uh, person is you're thrust in with, with powerful people, people, you know, uh, whether it's the doctors, the nurses, the police, um, how do you keep control in those situations? How do you, you know, build that trust and keep that control when you have so many um, chiefs in the room, I'll call it? Yeah, I'll tell you. Um, you know, I, I, I think I, tr I try and focus on so the, the victim, the, the patient victim that's that's in there in the trauma bay in the emergency room or or, or the police station or wherever I'm encountering them, um, really, really focusing on them and by my conduct and my body language and my and my verbal interactions that I try and keep I try and keep the focus on them and keep drawing people in, but also do whatever I can to diffuse the trauma, de-escalate de it de-escalate trauma responses. And that means sometimes, I mean, you know, dropping down, dropping down volume and voice tone. Um, I, you know, I, I will find myself, even in a hospital, I will find myself at times on one knee bedside so that, so that I'm not towering over them. Docs, docs routinely stand up and tower over the bed. Nurses, nurses do, but they, they've got good reason adjusting lines. But then they, even that, that subtle thing of being 
eyeball to eyeball at that level, sitting bedside or, or kneeling, kneeling a bit so that your, your, your eyeballs are eyeballs to them. And, and I think so voice control, body language and conveying, well, this is how I'm doing it. And you're right though, Ed, I mean, police officers, they can, they, they can, um, you know, cops, not a lot of cops are trauma informed, you know, they, so I try and do what I can to mitigate some of their hard chargingness um, and, and, and work with them on that. And it's subtle. I mean, it's, it's just subtle. Um, and the nurses, the nurses that do the rape kits, I mean, they're fantastic. Uh, but, but we've got to, you know, a, a lot of times I work with them to then help try and diffuse other people who may be injecting trauma or, or drama into the, uh, into the equation. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Um, so, Matt, what do you see as some of the skills that you have um, that really help you in building teams and, and how have you sharpened those skills so you know the difference between kind of what i in my team building and what you all are doing is because i am in a hierarchical relationship as ceo the rest of my team not it's it, it, it puts it it puts the onus on me to make my team both feel at ease that the conversation we're having in a brain drain is a safe space um, and so i spend an enormous amount of time with all new team members even introducing ideas to making sure that everybody understands that whatever they say in that room is okay. They can disagree with me as much as they want. So, you know, for me, I have to take an extra step to make sure that everybody understands that what groupthink is, is truly groupthink. And because the natural inclination is to, whoa, hold back. I don't want to be, and I can't have a successful team if they're not being transparent and they're not telling me the ideas that they need. So for me, uh, you know, a, a team, it's about creating a, that's that safe space uh, where you have, you know, you can get to that common goal if everybody understands that the, the conversations you're having um, are not about each other, not about ego, and it's about having a level playing field. Um, and so for me, I have to do that level playing field all the time. I also have to do it with, with, our, my, with my donors and my volunteers, right? So their ideas, they're coming in, but they're coming at it, they're coming at it in a different way. Their leadership, they believe their ideas are better or smarter or wiser sometimes. Um, in our case, we have to, I have to have the, the added risk of saying to them, how do you um, how do you take your ideas and what may not be in the best interest of the organization, but maybe a great idea for that program? So for me, it's about finding the commonality to set people at ease to allow the climate for groupthink to happen and teamwork to happen. I think we may have. I don't know if we lost Eric. I mean, lost you Ed, lost Eric. me. You lost me for a moment. I'm back. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no, that's okay. I just uh, saw the. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, see, well, see Ed, we were lost without our team leader. We were looking for you, buddy. <laughs> and that's what teammate, that's, that's teamwork though. I did, where, I looked for him, where, I did. Oh, yeah, yeah, where, where did Ed go? Let's find Ed, let's bring him back in. Let's make sure he's okay. We got you, buddy. <laughs> so Matt, in your work, I know that, that you are hierarchical, but of course you build teams through committee work and, and things like that. Um, you know, in our in our work, the average person thinks that the lawyers are the CEOs. Um, how do you, within your structures, how do you get people away from that hierarchical? I, I like with my senior staff, my, especially my chiefs, the the six people that have the chief title, chief development officer, chief operating officer. I'm, I've forced them to sit in other people's shoes, meaning I'll give responsibilities and make them work so that they understand the tasks of everybody else. I also, every couple of years, make them rewrite their job descriptions um, to, to, to more properly reflect what's happening as an evolving, every job changes. Um, in the case of your thing, because I think as Kristen points out, you don't have a CEO. I, I said to you when I had the prep for this call to everybody, I, I said to Ed and, and Eric and Becky that, um, that my assumption is that the lawyer is the lead in this thing. And they quickly told me the lawyer is not. That in this in your collaborative process, everybody, which I think is an incredible piece, because my, I would have assumed at that point that it's the attorney, he's the one who has the client, and you know the therapist and the other people on the, on, are there as supplemental. 
in our case, I try to have the same thing. It, it, just because I'm the CEO, that simply gives me management responsibility. That doesn't give me um, the province of the best ideas. So I truly have to spend the time uh, uh, to, 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 make that, to make that happen and get everybody under, understand that I'm not the CEO in those, in those places. Uh, and I keep coming back to that. But to me, my biggest challenge in building those committees and this thing is making sure that I'm not imposing my ideas and my thoughts and my preferences upon my team, both professional or otherwise. Steve, when you're in your situations, how do you um, level the playing field? It, it, it's, it's, taking, it's taking my victim first. Um, and again, in collaborative, you've got at least, you've got at least, you, you, have, you, you, have, you have a married couple that are going through this and there may be children too. But so, so for me though, so, so what that means in collaborative land, it's putting, putting, putting the couple that's divorcing and if they're kids, putting two, three, four, five, however many people, putting them all first. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's not in terms of keeping everybody, everybody in, in first place as much as possible. For me then, making that victim, making that victim understand that, that again, I, I believe her or him, that no violence is going to come to them, that they are safe. And, and in collaborative land, you know, different, I mean, generally, mercifully, different safety planning, unless there's a history of DV or other stuff. Um, but, but, it, but, but, but saying to people, you are, we collectively are putting you in first place, all of you will deal. So we have to deal one at a time, obviously at times to say, let's, let's adjust it, let's address issues, et cetera. But also you are safe here. That constant conveyance of safety, because if you convey safety, then you convey trust. I mean, you, you can't trust if you're not safe, but if you are safe and you convey that both, both emotionally, verbally, and physically, but again, by body language, I, I think there's so much power in, in where, where and how you approach things. I mean, again, I think of Rhonda. I mean, Rhonda Fuchs, I mean, Rhonda, Rhonda, will, Rhonda will position herself. And I know the, the, other, the other facilitators here on this, you, know, you all, one of your default settings is you're going to position yourself in a room. So if there is conflict, let's say there's a history of DV or there's a power imbalance or there's some other conflict going on, you're going to position yourself. And by you positioning yourself either in a neutral zone or separating the parties that could be even more conflict oriented. And maybe, maybe at the end of the day, Y'all are doing a great job and you've got two teammates that need to have, you know, th th they may need, you know, the school marm sitting in beta. Let's cool each other out here until we can debrief and let's figure out what's what's happening. Some. And so so I think that, again, the, the, the facilitator, the mental health professional, huge in terms of in terms of positioning verbally, emotionally, physically, depending on what's going on. And that's that that's that's so powerful here. And and again, what I try and do is I will at times position myself with my victim, with that patient. If I need to run, if I need to block, if I need to um, to be present in a way. And at times, being present also is just it's a verbal cue or a nonverbal cue. I, I am completely attending to what's happening here. Mark Sabosley, you um, put in two, word, two comments in there, empowerment and self-determination. You want to uh, share a little bit about what your thoughts are? Well, you know, I'm so um, taken by the way that Steve and Matt have described their work. And, you know, as a lawyer, spending a lot of my career um, in the power moves in court where you're looking to persuade a judge you gather up evidence, you look to fire away, you look to that target, you wanna shoot down, you wanna destroy the credibility. These are all the litigation words that you use. Lawyers have to get rid of that mindset completely and be willing to stop that whole entire way of looking at things. And it all comes down to allowing the client to be empowered. So if I inject my own opinion or my own attitude about what's right or wrong, I'm taking the power away from these people that we're trying to empower. And, you know, the term self-determination is 
is like the first ethical rule of the code of conduct for mediators. And so we, we abide by that same code of conduct. We're really looking to empower people and, and encourage them to have their own self-determination. And the magic happens when you give that power to the parties and they could talk about their own lives. Uh, Jeff Wasserman just said to everybody about a problem area. Part of this is, I think, just to the, the last point, that so when you talk about you talk about leadership or you talk about being the lead in something, oftentimes um, you you if you have to remind people, I tell people when I they come as my staff, when I hire new staff, especially senior staff, if you have to remind people that you're the boss, you're you failed at that moment. The moment you have to remind people that you're the boss or that you're this, I, I never once have to remind anybody because it's not, it's irrelevant. I'm Matt. I'm just Matt McCauley. Yes. Do I wear the hat of CEO? Absolutely. Do they know and respect that I'm the CEO at all times? Yes. Same way here. You don't, the, the attorney, your attorney knows they're representing the client, but they're, but they, but they have adopted a team environment. And so that notion of a safe space for everybody has to be it has to be it has to be primary so that you know they so that the attorney the therapist everybody the notion of safe space whether it's in your home whether it's in a hospital room like uh, like Steve's talking about or whether it's in a courtroom or in a family practice um, the notion of safe space that everybody has to perform uh, and react a certain way is is critically important and I just you know it's it's all about leadership personal leadership yeah, yeah I want to talk you know, about too, this I, little... I was... I'm sorry, ahead, I, I, just, I just want to follow up on this because I was thinking about this too. You know, the constant, and again, th this is where, again, uh, all the professionals involved, I mean, you know, financial mediator, or I'm sorry, uh, mental health professional facilitator, attorneys, et cetera. Um, you know, when, when, when these human beings walk into a collaborative process, n none of us know the depth of what their trauma history may truly be. You know, I, I, I see this all the time um, in, in our domestic violence shelter. I mean, we screen everybody that comes in for DV, for trafficking, and that that's, uh, oftentimes that gets disclosed later. I mean, so peeling away theirs. But, but if, you, if you accept and treat everyone that people, people may have it, perhaps a, a huge undisclosed trauma history and treat them with 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 a trauma-informed way and, and, and always be looking for cues and clues about other things that may come off. And, and, and the power of this is, because this is not litigation, this is not the decapitation, like Mark was talking about. I mean, did the decapitation win? That, Lynn, as a prosecutor, if I could be a prosecutor right now and go after traffickers, look out, baby, I'm decapitating everybody in my way. But that's a different gig than this, completely. And so, but, but, but being sensitive to that and waiting for people in a trusting, safe environment for maybe layers to come off that then can be helped and facilitated as you move forward through this process. This could end up being at the end of a trauma process of the divorce, also a completely liberating and, 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 and a new step in life to find other areas where they need, where, where people need and can get help for the first time after years. Jeff further mentions, you know, we're in a unique situation where the team is six or more people, but the professional team is really the team that's working together. And very often we do have uh, the clients, the people who are getting the divorce, who um, they, sh they shift their, their anger towards the team. Uh, they'll blame the team. Um, how do you best see handling situations like that when you've got somebody within the team who's looking to blame the rest of the team? Look, I think you have to you have to remind. I mean, that, this goes back. You know, you have to. It's it's about the willingness to speak up. That that the end result and the end goal matters, and the end result will be affected. They're not. If if the goal is to do the best for the client, then the other members of the team have to be able to say to that person. It's about the client here. You've signed on to this process because we want to get the best result here. You're taking us down a path that's absolutely going to leave the client either with bad taste in their mouth or not the end result we want them to. And, and again, you know, if, if you, I, I just think you guys are at such a small place that you can't afford to let somebody who be a team player for too long or else your entire collaborative process becomes, I would imagine, could become a, 
parking garage in a shit show. Uh, you know, if you have that particular aspect. So I, I think it's incumbent upon the team members, whether they're two, three, or four, to be able to police themselves. And it is about policing yourselves. It's about colleagues who police themselves in the in in our, in our room. It's about uh, uh, the female employee that feels that the male employee is mansplaining to them. And how do we deal with that as a manager and a mentor uh, at doing those things? Those are all parts of, I think, what we're dealing with, whether it's in the collaborative process there or sitting in a boardroom uh, of mine. Steve Blumenthal has a, an interesting point. I want to bring Steve up for just a minute. Steve, you talk about that members' behaviors could be motivated by attempts to protect themselves. Explain a little more what you're asking there. Yes, um, I guess in any of these discussions, it's easy for uh, comments to come off as if someone's blaming or being blamed when people uh, want to protect themselves or defend themselves. or um, um, it's, you know, It just seems that all these uh, similar dynamics could be at play maybe to a smaller or same extent, you know, among the members. Okay, thanks, Steve. You're welcome. Uh, Matt or, and or Steve, do you ever find it helpful to, you know, if you've got a dysfunctional team to bring someone else in to help the team? We're, we're just finishing one right now. We just, we're, we're, we're about a year and a half in with a management consultant that was brought in first for my chiefs to help uh, deal with some of the upstairs, downstairs issues. Uh, upstairs being marketing campaign, uh, foundation, legacy, other pieces, downstairs being finance, IT, you know, the, ex the internal versus the external. And we have spent the last year and a half rebuilding and tearing down the bridges and rebuilding the bridges to the point of putting, mixing up the floors, putting departments put together uh, and created a new dynamic that has worked dramatically. It only happened by bringing an outside facilitator who was able to gain the trust uh, of but not only the senior staff, but the mid-level management staff uh, and have done one-on-ones and have done a series of triad conversations between their manager, the, the, the vice president and the facilitator. Uh, and I, I believe that I'm a big, 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 big proponent of outside facilitators because they come in with a fresh pair of eyes. If they're good and they're trained well, uh, they're able to do things uh, and move people because they it's, it's somebody new for an employee, especially a problematic employee, to gain the trust with, and and that person to help them get them over the hump if they're not there yet. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I, I absolutely, and you know what? Again, I, I think you know hospitals, but also our shelter, um, uh, uh, homeless shelters. Uh, uh, when I'm doing so with children and youth services, when I. I, I mean, I, I, I've, I've got people in mind that, that might help inject a new perspective or a new way of looking at things or a new way of processing information or someone who I know is, is really good in terms of this type of a situation, what, what this person may have experienced or is experiencing. I mean, and, and I, I got to tell you, I mean, I, when, I, when I was at that secure youth detention facility with this 14 year old girl just last week, uh, I brought in one of our two therapy dogs. And, and I had the blessing of the executive director and a number of the counselors and Snickers. Snickers is an eight and a half pound senior little rescue dog. And this kid who had been through hell and back, and I brought, I, they, they, they had been working with her and, and I, I brought him in and within 10 minutes, Snickers was sitting on this kid's lap. And 10 minutes later, she said, can I keep him? And the disclosures that she met, she made to us that the staff who had had her for two weeks hadn't seen. And, but it was, there was a whole bunch of things going on there. But, and while this is not normally in collaborative bringing a, a, a therapy dog, but why not? I mean, my point is this, that the thinking outside the box, that's trite, I know, but, but thinking creatively and thinking in a nonlinear fashion, who can we bring in if necessary to rebalance or change the focus or, or plant a new way of perception that again provides at the end the goal of let's move us all collectively forward, trust, hope, safety. 
Great, Steve. I want to just spend a couple of minutes. I want to bring Sheila Fur up because she asks an interesting question. We not only deal, obviously, as collaborative professionals with our collaborative teams and with working with uh, our clients, but we have organizational structures. Uh, in each community, we have practice groups. Uh, many states have state organizations. And I think Sheila has a, a question and a point relative to that. Sheila? Thanks, Ed. So we, we generally think about our work being in the area of family law and most of our organizations that has been the focus, but we're thinking of expanding outside the box. And that is to where can we bring our techniques, our methods and the value of a professional team to um, other places where preserving relationships is important. So we're starting to look at agencies, governmental groups, organizations, the kinds of things that you see, and, and that I, I know a lot about what you do, that there are, there are conflicts within, within groups of people. And we think the strength of our collaborative approach is really the synergy of the team, that we all bring different skills and training and experience besides different personalities and communication styles, as you referenced. But we see a real value of expanding what we do um, outside of family law into working with groups, um, whether it be a board or an agency or whatever. What do you think? All in, love it. Um, <laughs> well, you, you know, too, I mean, I, I'll tell you, I mean, I think, yeah, I, I think this, this collaborative, multidisciplinary, multi-member team approach to, to, to look at things in a non-linear, non-traditional manner, uh, take the paradigm and flip it upside down uh, gently so people don't fall out of their chairs. But, but, you know, but, but really, let's defy gravity and take a look. I mean, you know, I, I see so much stuff going on. Again, a lot of this is high conflict or high potential in my, on my planet of anti-trafficking, but you know, children and youth services, uh, secure facilities, uh, prisons, um, places where at times people are thrown away. And granted, if we have violent people, I, I gotta get violent people off the street so they cannot continue to perpetuate violence. But at the end of the day, so much of that comes from a previous trauma. And so, and that then leads to conflict and, and secure facilities have it on and on. But Sheila, I think you're right. I think there's so much that can be done here where, where there is conflict or trauma, either direct on the surface or lurking underneath, and the lurking underneath that hasn't been that has been peeled away, and that is causing eruptions and people came here. Why are we having volcanoes and seismic shifts going on when it's it's not readily apparent? And so that's where a multidisciplinary team with again with 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 mental health professionals uh, acting in concert with others can really make things happen. I think. Yeah, I was just gonna say. I, 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 go ahead. No, you go. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead I, I, no, I was just gonna say. Look, I think uh, you know, in 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 on all of these collaborative ventures, Sheila, we are um, we're finding how we find the value added, right? So um, it, for for you know, it, the value added can only be uh, if an outside facilitator or somebody like that can ultimately help bring about um, a more successful, you know, a client and a, a successful outcome. But for me, I just I have to say, uh, you know, how we go about how we go about building that team, it's 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 all about making sure the right people. And if you have to use some outside sources, it's all good, you know. Sally you raised a question. I think Randy answered it. We uh, if we bring in somebody from the outside, we, they just need to sign on to the participation right. agreement. Right. But that that right. But that we discussion... use and we use NDAs for the same thing for our reasons. So it's our business. Yeah, but but. Does the client have to like, will the client be paying them? Do you have to go through the retainer, pro, you know, all that stuff? Has Sally, we're going to, yeah, the, that's a great question. Um, I think that's up to the team and up to a discussion of the team. I think if it's strictly for the use of the professionals, it might be that someone comes in on a volunteer basis to help out. You know, it may just be meeting with the team one time. I've had that happen where the team just met with an outside person just to discuss the issues and the outside person was able to give them a new perspective. So I think it depends on what you need. But I will tell you that that's going to be something we'll discuss a little bit more next month. Uh, we're going to dive deeper next month into taking this whole process, this whole thought of 
building teams and go more specifically into building teams within the collaborative process. Um, as I mentioned, our guests next month will be Susan Guthrie and Brian Galbraith, two highly trained and highly respected collaborative professionals. Um, I want to thank both Matt and Steve for this excellent presentation and giving us an outside perspective. Um, of, of team building, uh, not just within the collaborative process, but how you build teams in, in other uh, communities. Uh, we want to thank you again and thank everybody for joining us. We invite everybody to join us next month, the fourth Thursday of the month at 1 p.m. Eastern time as we'll continue this discussion and also join us tomorrow for our happy hour, 4.30 p.m. Eastern time, where we'll also continue some more discussion on team building and and other issues that may come up matt and steve again thank you very much for joining thank you us. everybody it was really nice meeting everybody hey Thanks. thank thank you all for your time too appreciate it thank you everyone and we will see you tomorrow at happy hour and next month at our collaborative learning introductory program thank you <laughs>